Well, hello, welcome. We're going to talk today, this time, about the history of geology. Uh, and we're going to talk about it in terms of paradigms. And paradigm is a word you probably haven't heard before, but it really just means big shifts in thinking overall within a discipline. So, you know, you've had paradigms in your life without realizing it. When you were a child, you viewed things as a child. When you're a teenager, it's a different paradigm. The world appears different to you. That's all a paradigm is. It's a way to view the world. So, geology is a story of paradigms. You know, it either looks one way or it looks the other, depending on the person you're talking to. That's what this comic's trying to get at. So it's a successive transition from one paradigm to another via some sort of revolution. It's the usual development pattern, developmental panel of, of mature science. That's Thomas Kuhn, who is a famous philosopher of science. And usually, the, you know, a, a, stair, a set of sta, uh, stair steps is considered the way paradigms are often viewed. So here's one paradigm, here's the next paradigm, here's the next paradigm all leading towards some eventual, um, you know, some eventual goal. But we don't necessarily know what that goal is, um, other than just saying in a vague way, better understanding of the world around us. <clears throat> so, geology, the first earliest paradigm within geology, of course geology wasn't a science back in these days, but in the old days, um, everybody accepted that the earth was pretty old. Uh, they didn't know how old, but they knew it was old, ancient. So Aristotle, we often begin with him uh, in the West, uh, we recognize that river deposits were depo you know, recognize that river deposits were unique the types of deposits, and that fossil seashells from rocks were similar to those found on the beach, indicating that the, the fossils were once living animals. Um, he also deduced that the positions of land and sea had changed, and thought these changes occurred over long periods of time. Move on. There's a picture of Aristotle for you guys. Moving on to Theophrastus, who wrote one of the first books on geology called Perilithon, which means on stones. Uh, had some, his work was authoritative for centuries, but he basically described minerals and ores from mines that were local to Athens. So again, he was a Greek, <clears throat> a student of Aristotle. There's Theophrastos. There's the good old Greek there. Theophrastos Melanta Eresios. That's what that, is what that says. Okay, Pliny the Elder, who is a, is a Roman guy, um, son of uh, the father of Pliny the Younger, correctly identified amber as fossilized tree resin and also identified a diamond as an octahedral crystal. So these are all little contributions that these guys have made. Abu al-Rayman al-Biruni uh, described the geology of India, discovered that decided that India was once covered by a sea. And the, Him uh, the Him Himalayan mountains show that. The Himalayan mountains are, you know, full of fossils at the top. So they must have been covered by water at one point. That's the only way the fossils up there, at least the marine fossils. Uh, Ibn Sina <clears throat> wrote a commentary on Aristotle's mineralogy and meteorology. Um, and he does, in, in that commentary, he discussed the formation of mountains, clouds, water sources, earthquakes, and so forth. He was an Arab uh, geologist. Shen Kua, this is over in China now. So you can see, it's, you know, people were looking at the natural world around them and, try, and discussing it all over the world, not just in the Middle East and Europe, but also in China. Came up with a hypothesis for land formation, observed fossil shells and mountains. There's that theme again. And that land was formed by the erosion of mountains and the deposit, deposition of silt. And then Augustine of Hippo. Now, to read this, you're going to have to pause. Um, but this is a really good passage. I'm not going to spend time on it here. But just pause it to read it. Basically, Augustine's saying that, you know, and of course, he's a big Christian thinker. Um, if the pagans see that the earth is ancient and know that it's ancient and we don't understand that, then we look bad as Christians. So it's, an, it's a very interesting passage to read. And he was a big... He was a big. Um, uh, he was a well. He was a big scholar on Genesis at the time. <clears throat> There's Augustine for it. Well, one variation of Augustine. Obviously, nobody ever holds a flaming heart, but that's just the art, 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 you know, the artistry of it. And of course, you get people like Leonardo da Vinci who dabbled in all kinds of things, but he he recognized a bunch of stuff about fossils and rivers and so on and so forth, and determined that the whole of geologic time must be much longer than we think it is. So that brings us to paradigm two. The second paradigm is one that's still held on by some folks uh, in today, and that is a paradigm we call catastrophism, which is essentially creationism. Now, the first creationist was really Bame, Bishop James Usher. He was an Irish bishop, no, archbishop, who wrote the famous book, The Annals of the Old Testament, deduced from the first origins of the world. Can he derive the age of the earth using biblical chronologies, all those uh, somewhat tedious lists of people who begat people who begat people and so on, um, determining that the age of the earth, the earth was created on October 23rd, 4004 BC at 9 something in the morning, um, which is pretty precise. Um, 
it's, t it's difficult to recreate this, but you know, anyway, it, it comes down to about a 6,000 year old Earth. And most creationists these days, the answers in Genesis organization types will say six to 10,000 years. Um, but it's, you know, they don't come down with a, with a def definitive number. Um, but he is the main reference for early catastrophism, which is an idea that was popular in the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe, that Earth's landscapes have been shaped primarily by great catastrophes. So all the mountains and everything, and rivers, canyons, and so forth, were created suddenly through big global events like Noah's flood and so forth. This is uh, Bishop Usher. And you know, one one scientist. Uh, there was one scientist who, back in those days, who's quoted as a, as a creationist. And this is, again, we're talking mostly 17th or 18th century here. Um, and that's George Cuvier. <clears throat> you know, who's a you know he, he did a bunch of other stuff as well. But um, he, this is just emblematic of the ideas at the time. There's other people too I could mention, but I'm just going to stick with him. There are six major catastrophes that occurred in the past, and so on. One of them being Noah's flood, and so forth. So that's one idea. The third paradigm is that of gradualism, which came along in the 19th century mostly. Uh, somewhat, <clears throat> well not just the 19th, the 17th as well. These are the present processes are the key to understanding past processes. That's a term called uniformitarianism. And that these present processes must be currently observable. Rivers and the, process, the things that they do down cutting into the earth must be observable to be able to take those deposits and make them, you know, just to see them in the geologic past and understand and be able to describe what they actually do. It gives geology a scientific basis for the first time as an observational science, giving it the ability to draw conclusions about the past. Nicholas Steno, uh, oops, the father of modern stratigraphy, this is going into the 17th century, very religious guy as you can tell. Uh, he was actually the, a, a canon of the church, but came up with uh, the principles of relative age dating, so superposition, horizontality, and so forth. We'll get to those shortly. James Hutton, very famous Scottish gentleman farmer physician. They all did a bunch of things back in those days. He's a wealthy uh, gentleman. <clears throat> Wrote a book called The Theory of the Earth. I have a copy in the classroom for you. Um, he was the big guy who formulated the idea of uniformitarianism, that all laws that operate today have also operated in the geologic past. So we have to understand present processes before we can understand past ones. Back during this time, there was also this discussion of Plut Plutonus versus Neptunus. You can read about it. Um, did rocks come from the ocean or did rocks come from magma was the big controversy. Finally, or I think it's finally, Charles Lyell, another Scottish geologist, wrote a book called The Principles of Geology, which popularized uniformitarianism and was a major influence in Charles Darwin, who, of course, was the other big influence in the, uh, there's a picture of this, one of his sketches, very accurate, uh, geologic layers and so forth. Um, Darwin was a big deal. So. There are many other many other guys, Charles Darwin being one of them. Of course, he's mostly biology, but we could go through all these and go nuts. But basically, these guys all believe that the earth, everything on Earth happened very, very slowly. There were no catastrophes. Finally, the modern view, okay, is that it's a combination of the two, that there are things that occur slowly, and then there are big events that occur rapidly, like the asteroid that led to the destruction, the, the, the extinction of the dinosaurs. Okay, and Will Durant famously quoted, famously summarized this, civilization exists by geologic consent, subject to change without notice. You know, last year about this time, we had the earthquake here in Virginia. And those things, you know, we don't know when they're going to happen. They're sudden catastrophic events. Most of the time, rivers are down cutting and no one even notices it. Mountains are being built, no one even notices it because plate tectonics is slow. Sometimes there are things that happen rapidly. Now, that's not to say that there isn't controversy still. There are many people who have different, different ideas about how the Earth works. Um, there is the predominant view of 99.9% .9 of all scientists, which is the modern paradigm that I was just describing, that most everything is gradual except for some individual catastrophes. Um, a balance, essentially. But there are people who debate the age of the Earth. <clears throat> now, I'm a 4.6 billion year old person. I'm also a Christian. I have no problem uh, putting the two together. But young, modern young earth creationism really came out of the Seventh Day Adventist um, with Ellen White back in the 19th century. Um, up until that point, it had been, um, it was not thought of it anymore. There's also the modern, you know, the modern creationists call themselves scientific creationism, but they can't be science. You can't call them, call it scientific creationism because it's not science. You cannot, you can apply science, scientific ideas to some things, but you can't just 
you know, taking scientific scientists' research and then just debunking it isn't, isn't science to begin with. But also, science um, has to be has to be built upon by definition things that are unbound things that are bounded. They have limits, and so as such, God can't be considered. You know, using God as an explanation can't be considered science. Now, that doesn't mean God doesn't exist. That doesn't mean you can't invoke God. But to call it science would be wrong. Intelligent design, theistic evolution, this is closer to where I fall, uh, and so forth. Um, there are, of course, the secular evolutionists, which I hardly disagree with. Um, anyway, that's the modern controversy. So we can talk more about that in class if you want to, but really the, the bottom line is just to illustrate that science is a, is a progression 